I am thrilled to be joined by our special guest who hails from Lubbock, Texas. She pursued her studies at Amarillo College, the University of Houston, and earned a master's at Westminster College in music and pedagogy. This statuesque soprano with a big <laughs> voice and a flair for the spinto roles begins to find her musical way here and abroad. But it's her work on the business side of the arts which really begins to garner some notice. Uh, her success at audience engagement, development and fundraising soon has her taking up posts in Chicago and New York. This past fall, she was named general director of Fort Worth Opera, and I am just so pleased to speak with her. Thank you for being here, Miss Afton Battle. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much for having me. That introduction makes me want to break out a, a score and start singing again. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll have we'll have just talk for right now, I'm sure. You can give us your <laughs> opatria mia maybe at the end. Uh, <laughs> so I guess my first question, as I always ask folks, um, is how and when did you get the opera bug? I got the opera bug later in life. I was about 18 or 19. Um, Myla Gibson, who was my voice teacher, my first voice teacher, uh, she discovered me uh, at a Miss Juneteenth pageant. Um, and so I started taking lessons with her and she took us to a Nats competition in North Texas. And we went to the opera to see Tosca, uh, no, Traviata. And uh, we are at the theater and it was my first opera that I'd seen live. And it was beautiful and it was so emotional. And <laughs> I know my husband's probably like tired of hearing this story and he can hear me in the other room, but Anyway, so we're at the opera and it's beautiful and it's emotional and it's just nothing like I'd ever experienced before. And we're in the final act and Flora gets, she uh, gets her last breath of, you know, excitement and air about her and she twirls around and then she falls like dead on the ground, you know, and she, it's that, you know, famous scene uh, oh, joy. And then she right. turns around, flails around, and then falls on the ground. And at that moment, I thought, I have to do this. Like, this is completely exactly what in my life I should be doing. And it was then, it was then and there, I, I kind of got bitten by the bug. Before that, I was really not taking it too seriously. And then at that point, I was like, eh, this is it. I went to school when we got back to Amarillo and changed my major wow. from business to vocal performance. Wow. Now, I know your father was uh, was a minister, correct? Mm -hmm. Had you found your voice at church? Were you employed, you know, were you pulled in to you know, sing this and sing that all the time? Oh, absolutely. Uh, my dad is a minister. My grandfather was a minister. So I, I grew up singing in church and grew up at, uh, you know, all of the, the revivals and the, the church choir rehearsals and all of that. So I guess you could say, like, I found my voice in the church choir. Uh, I think everyone has a voice in the church choir, whether it fits mm. in or not. <laughs> um, but most definitely uh, grew up singing in church from my grandfather to my father, here and all in between. Got you. Now, last fall, I mentioned, of course, you were named general director uh, at, at Fort Worth Opera, a company with a, a history, 75 years nearly. Uh, I was aware of that history even back when I was in high school. Uh, I would read uh, about, you know, Lily Pons and Beverly Sills and Plasto Domingo who would make performances there. What does this appointment mean for you personally? And what uh, will it mean and does it mean for Fort Worth? Wow, personally, it's really, his, I mean, historic and truly legendary. And it's very big. It's, it's, it's bigger than I am, actually. Um, and so for me, it, it is things that I never knew that I wanted, you know, if that makes any sense. You know, I'd been trying to get into nonprofit and arts management and in opera, for so long and I was just really focused on you know development because that's where my background is I never once ever thought that I wanted to be or could be a general director so for me it is it is the dreams of my ancestors mm -hmm. um, and that's why I say is much bigger than me um, 
But for me also in that same vein, personally, it is a huge achievement and it is the culmination of everything that I think is the good and the best of myself, you know, the good of having learned what I've learned as an arts administrator and the best of having been a singer and having, you know, sung on stages and done the whole rehearsal thing and knowing opera and the classical art form as well as I do, um, you know, just coming together in almost uh, a perfect harmony. Um, for Fort Worth and the people of Fort Worth, I think that this appointment means and signifies change. It means and signifies, uh, you know, much needed change and growth. Uh, I think for the city, it, uh, it really identifies that this company is ready to move into uh, this time of, you know, in the 21st century is ready to take their leap and really to take their place on the stage, if that makes sense, uh, in terms of other uh, companies and our colleagues. Um, and for the people of Fort Worth, I hope that, you know, my appointment not only means, but will show that we as a company are dedicated to enriching the lives of the community and bringing the best of Fort Worth Opera to the community um, through programming and initiatives and partnerships, but that we are here for the community to really have an inclusive uh, relationship with them. That's true. So the issues of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, certainly we know are not new to our business or our society, but it seems to me with the murder of George Floyd this past year in particular, a, a, a brighter light has been shown on these issues. Uh, and I think, and it seems like, you know, businesses and non-for-profits are really starting to step up and respond. What do you make of some of the efforts that you've seen, particularly in our business regarding this issue? I think that uh, our, my colleagues uh, and this industry have really taken strong strides uh, to address the inequities in the industry, to address uh, the imbalance, right, uh, within the industry, and starting to put into place those uh, footholds, you know, that allow them to climb and allow them to stabilize the work that they're doing. Um, you know, it's no it's nothing new to our industry, like you said, and to myself, that there is and has been a history of um, inequity within the opera industry, um, that there just has been this very stronghold, if you will, of uh, leaders within the industry who, you know, um, may or may not go beyond what their eyes see in order uh, for casting or just to be more than tolerant and to be accepting of, oh, actually, uh, a Black woman can sing the role of, uh, you know, Cho Cho San, or a Black woman can sing the role of a Countess or Susanna, you know. Um, and so, I think that we have, as an industry, finally been able to face, begin to face that mirror of the past and the reason why opera as an art form has since long been seen as an elitist art form mm -hmm. and start to remove and break down those barriers. And so I see, and and am encouraged by the work that I see in the industry from my colleagues, from you know folks who I know personally, and some that I don't know personally, and I just you know follow them and who they are, and to see the work that they're doing. You know, um, I take you know Minnesota Opera for one example, and uh, the hiring of their. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion officer, mm -hmm. which is tremendous. I take San Francisco Opera and their diversity, equity, and inclusion officer there, which is a huge resource to the rest of this industry to be able to look at companies like that, to be able to look at companies like Michigan Opera Theater and say, y'all have these professionals in, this, in these positions who we 
can draw from their experience to help us to continue to make those strides forward. So I'm really encouraged by the work that I'm seeing. I'm encouraged by the conversations that are happening. I'm encouraged by the more than just the want to change. I am encouraged by the actions to implement the change. Oh, fantastic. Now, as opera companies begin to sort of invite more diverse voices and people around this table, you know, um, and with changing cultures and that sort of thing, with all these systems that have, worried, that have stood in the way of diversity and equity, um, what are some of the ways um, that, you know, we can help invite communities who typically have maybe have not felt invited in the past? How do you how do you reach out? What do you do to get them to say, hey, let me give you a, a, a maybe a second look or maybe a first look? Oh, absolutely. You have to create programming and initiatives that speak to the communities in which you desire to serve. You have to create uh, resources that speak to those communities in which you desire to serve. And the only way that you can do that is by listening to those communities in which you desire to serve. I can't go into any community and say, well, I don't know what it is that you want, but I'm going to give you X, Y, and Z. You know, that is not the way that you build a relationship that is reciprocal. You have to know what the need is, uh, where the desires are, where the intersections are. So for companies that desire to go out and to cast a large net for this type of work, we have to listen. We have to openly listen you know, and comprehend, because there's a difference, right? We have to hear, we have to listen, we have to comprehend, and then we have to act. We can't, you know, like I said, go in with our bag of tools and say, this is all we got. You know, we have to be able to adjust to what the needs are. And in, uh, you know, for Fort Worth Opera, for example, you know, not only creating the platform and the initiative of Noche de Opera, which is an initiative that uplifts the Hispanic community, we have to do more than just provide Spanish speaking operas. We have to be able to provide resources and programs that keep the community, that keep the Hispanic community engaged, that keep us in front of them as their company as their, you know, as part of their community. Um, the same with the Black community, you know, we can't only offer a poor gambus and then go off our very merry way and never have any interaction again. You know, there's something very sweet um, about the art form of education in a way that develops the mind of adults and children, and especially when it comes to music education. Because so many times, you know, you hear people say, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that Fort Worth had an opera. I don't know what opera is. I didn't know Black people sang, you know, sing opera, like all of those, um, all of those uh, preconceived notions. And there's something very sweet about reversing that and turning that around. So for us, some things that you know we've done in order to get out in front of the community have been Fuego, our Fort Worth Opera Go, which is a pickup truck and a trailer. Sometimes it's just uh, our box truck. It is us going into the community. Um, a Night of Black Excellence was another huge um, initiative and step for this company to engage with the Black community to show our investment in the community. And if we are not showing investment in the Black community, the Hispanic community, the LGBTQIA plus community, the Asian American community, if we're not showing our investment in those communities, then we don't have a genuine desire to serve those communities. And that's what we need is investment and a genuine desire to serve those communities. Fantastic. I was going to say, you mentioned uh, A Night of Black Excellence. That that performance like reverberated all over the opera world <laughs> around. People were talking about that. I believe you guys did a an encore performance. Is that still available for anyone who might want to be able to see it? Can we go to your website or is that not available yet? No, it is not available anymore, okay. uh, our okay. encore performance. But uh, we are working, actually, we had such a huge... Uh, response and uh, uh, 
need, if you will, for educators to use portions of a night of black excellence in their music education curriculum. So we are working to pare down uh, all two hours and 10 minutes mm -hmm. into a more digestible uh, period, you know, for most classes to offer that to music, music educators as part of their music education curriculum, in addition to uh, a curriculum that we are building. Because the, the wonderful thing about a night of black excellence was, yes, we did it during Black History Month and in celebration of black arts and culture and artisans. But as some of our panel said, you know, black history is every day and it is not just a month. Um, and the unique thing about a night of black excellence is you can plug that into your curriculum as a teacher any time of the year, any day of the week. And it is relevant because the, uh, the repertoire that was offered, you know, spanned from classical to, you know, modern to spirituals and the array of composers were not only Black composers, but, you know, also we have Verdi and Puccini and mm -hmm. Mozart, you know, so it is a wide variety of musical education learning. Yeah, fantastic. I remember you had a, a couple of names that uh, Michigan Opera Theater folks definitely know, Nicole Heaston and Latanya Moore, Kenny Overton, who all are just so loved uh, in Michigan operas, at Michigan Opera Theater. So it was fantastic, simply fantastic. Can I ask you this question? When I originally got into this business a few years back, um, I went in, I came in uh, doing artist management. Uh, and so I was often surprised uh, by how often people running these companies often didn't know very much about the art. And so I'm wondering, uh, what does you, your, the fact that you have this background as a singer, now you bring that to the back office or the front office, uh, what does that mean? How do you think this will have an effect on what we see in the future? Well, it's huge. You hit the nail on the head. There are, you know, folks out there were and currently are who don't have, um, the deepest of connection with the art form who don't have the longest of history and or knowledge of the art form. And I don't want to say that it's limited, limiting, but there are some limitations, you know, to uh, maybe understanding or, you know, knowing, you know, Popea and the story and how cool it would be to flip it on its head and do like a rock version of Popeye. You know, anyway, you have to like know the history before then you can change it. Yeah. Um, so for me, it is, uh, it is a huge asset in my opinion. Um, it is one that allows me, I think, and feel and hope to work more intimately and deeply with Joe Illick, who is our artistic director, mm -hmm. and also allows us to equally come to the table as artists and creatives to say, yes, this show, yes, this voice, yes, then this voice, yes, then this ensemble, and then what about this, you know, versus him having to have all of that uh, weight, I suppose, on his shoulders of, you know, being the sole artistic driver. Mm. Um, also, I think that it adds a level for me of uh, having had my own previous career, if you will, uh, as a singer and done all of these auditions, a level of um, empathy <laughs> when here, you know, uh, you know, when hearing singers. Uh, I've judged a couple of competitions most recently, and to be on this side of the table uh, does not come with an ill intention or regret or uh, 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 malice, not malice, but uh, I don't feel jaded in any way uh -huh. that I'm sitting here like, well, that should have been me and that could have been me, but that like, I am legitimately rooting for everyone to do their very best, you know? Right. And so it, it brings, I think, you know, just a different level of appreciation to the art, uh, a different ear, obviously, that, you know, that you are listening to the art with and that you are visualizing like the whole scene, you know, you hear someone sing, you know, Karanome and you are envisioning not only that, 
that aria, but the whole opera and how this person could fit into that whole scenario. So um, I think that, you know, it is, it is definitely uh, a plus and a blessing and, uh, you know, a positive to have folks in these leadership positions artistically and, you know, general director, et cetera, who have that knowledge, passion, and deep intersection with the art form. Wow. So I want to ask one question. You're about to celebrate your 75th anniversary, which I'm sure has been hard trying to figure out how to just get through this pandemic. Uh, anything you, like, you can share with us about uh, the 75th coming up or is it still under wraps at this point? It is still under wraps at this point, but we are definitely um, hoping to plan planning some uh, some really great uh, experiences and while keeping everyone safe and um, also while celebrating our diamond anniversary, which is a huge thing uh, for us. And I wanna do it in a way that uh, includes our entire community, that includes everyone, that it's not so priced out that, you know, someone, you know, working down at the bank can't afford to come, you know, and they really want to. Um, so we're looking at a, um, a possible, star-studded concert, um, as well as remaining very dedicated to our, our Noches de Opera uh, initiative with a, a Spanish language piece. And um, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, continuing on my personal mission and goal, and also Joe's uh, personal mission and goal to highlight and elevate the voices of BIPOC artists who are telling stories of uh, their own, of those individuals. Um, something that I'm very passionate about is giving the space to Black creatives to tell stories, of, to tell Black stories. Hopefully, if the stars all align, uh, those things will be coming to uh, our folks in 21-22. Fabulous. My last question, if I may, of course, we are uh, recognizing uh, women doing amazing things this month, and you are among them. I'm wondering, <clears throat> what drives you to keep this up? I mean, I'm sure there's been a lot of frustration uh, with this <laughs> business and this pandemic. And, uh, you know, what drives you to keep pushing forward to say, hey, we're going to make this thing work? <laughs> oh, um, seeing and hearing the the people's response and reactions to what we do. Seeing and hearing the industry's response and people, uh, audience members, their response to a night of black excellence. Mm -hmm. Seeing and hearing the community's response to our FUOGO programs. Um, seeing and hearing, you know, the community's response to our online digital programming. Um, that's what keeps, you know, that's what keeps me going. And it also keeps me inspired to do it again and do it better and to keep doing it. So while like COVID definitely has hit this industry in a way very much like, you know, Broadway and our other performing arts uh, colleagues um, has hit us in a way that seems like it will be difficult to bounce back. I have found such um, enjoyment and encouragement and gratification in finding these ways to continue to bring the performing arts to the community when we're not able to gather in the theater. And that's really what keeps me going. Wow, well, Ms. Afton Battle, you've made my day and so I'm sure our listeners as well. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been quite a pleasure.